Nornskold appeared in district court on the day appointed. The lawyer handling the case, after diligent search, had been unable to find any law prohibiting the removal of ancient relics by anyone, from either from the state of Colorado or the territory of the United States. The complaint, therefore, was dismissed, and the Swedish archaeologist was permitted to depart with his boxes. His collection, amounting to some 600 specimens, was seen on a tour in Europe, later was brought back to Stockholm, and is now in the National Museum of Helsinki, Finland. The Baron's greatest contribution, however, is not the collection, but his report on the summer's work. Cliff Dwellers of Mesa Verde, published in 1893 at Stockholm, now a collector's item of rare value, the book was the first major record of archaeological work in the United States. Richard and Baron Nordsgold corresponded at intervals until the latter's death in 1895, at the age of 26. One of the letters addressed to Richard was written from Stockholm in January 1893, and indicates a cordial relationship which continued to exist between them. It is given much shortened here. My dear friend, I just got yours of December 13th, as you are already on your trip. Richard was then in Grand Gulch, Utah. It will take some time before this reaches you. I wish you success in your trip, and would like awfully much to be in the party. I have been in Spain one month, and came just a few days ago back to Sweden. As I think I have told you, my Mesa Verde collection is exhibited there. I got a gold medal for the collection and the photos. Among the most interesting things in the exposition was a collection from the Hemingway expedition. It comprised mostly pot objects from the modern Mokis, but also pottery excavated in ruins near the Moki villages. This pottery is of the transitional kind, but more like the modern than the ancient ware. I do not think there is any transition between the modern and ancient pottery, but that the modern kind is a new element introduced by some new people. Yours truly, G. Nordenskold. P.S. If you would strike some nice Navajo blankets, send them to me. In the vanguard of an increasing stream of visitors who enjoyed the hospitality of Alamo Ranch, Frederick H. Chapin, Baron Nordsgold and Dr. Birdsall were among the first to help spread knowledge of Mesa Verde across two continents. Also, among the first guests was an Eastern girl who helped to divert Richard's mind from an unrequited love affair. Julia Cowing spent a good share of four summers with the Wetherills and became a devoted friend. They met first in the summer of 1891 when Nornsgold was at work in the cliff dwellings. With her brother and sister-in-law, the James R. Cowings of Brooklyn, New York, she had been touring Yellowstone in the Black Hills of South Dakota. None of them was accustomed to the seamy or rough side of Western life. In Denver, a friend, recently moved from the East, insisted they would find Mesa Verde more intriguing than Salt Lake City, the next point on their itinerary. Succumbing to this enthusiasm, knowing nothing of what they might be getting into, they soon found themselves on a dusty tangent, bumpily headed for Mancos. Stepping off the train at Durango, Julia Cowing knew she was due for an unusual experience. She had traveled far and often from Brooklyn from one resort to another, rarely having to endure anything less civilized than Denver's Brown Palace Hotel. Now, quite suddenly, all was different. Down the dusty, wide main street, flanked by low brick and frame false fronts, surrounded on all sides by the high-shadowing mountains, she was face to face with a wild west. The cowboys, grimy miners and bearded prospectors in from the hills and shouldering by, were a dangerous or shaggy breed. She didn't shrink. She was thrilled. Her excitement lasted all during the ride over the mountain road to Mancos, where she and her companions were directed to the Alamo Ranch. She was a tall, slender woman in her early thirties, her medium blonde hair worn in the short, curly bangs then fashionable. Richard and his brothers found her cheerful, curiously different, and a small powder charge for any effort they made at conversation. She wasn't really pretty, but engaging. When Richard suggested he take the Cowings on a three-day pack trip to Cliff Palace, it never occurred to him that it might prove a painful ordeal for the girl. If Julie Cowling had any misgivings, she kept them to herself and accepted at once. She had assumed that Cliff Dwellings, rather like Niagara Falls, were within strolling distance of a comfortable, safe vantage point. Her first glimpse of the Mesa's forbidding majesty had 
chilled her, but she was unwilling now to surrender. The trip by horseback, with two knights out under the stars, led to warm friendship between Richard and the Cowings, but the rough trail so exhausted Julia's strength that for several days after their return she remained in her room. At the end of the week Julia was herself again. She agreed readily when the Wetherills, with casual friendliness, proposed the visitors remain longer. When James and his wife said they must leave, Julia said she would stay on alone a few weeks longer. Julia Cowing returned the following summer at the Wetherill's invitation, accompanied by Lita Harkness, a relative of about her own age, and remained until fall. And in the summer of 1893 she came back again to the Alamo Ranch with her nephew, Herbert Cowing, a boy of fifteen. They remained two months and returned again the year following for a similar length of time. A faded photograph found in an attic in Hamden, Connecticut, shows Richard julia and young herbert cowing resting in the trail to cliff palace in the foreground there is a skelter of camp gear in the background a tent with tall brush rising all around this is the place richard named soda springs camp that a man of richard's forceful personality would exert a strong attraction is quite natural how Herbert Cowing wrote more than fifty years after, that her personality and background should have an equal reaction on him should also be expected. There is no doubt such mutual attraction and esteem can exist. It was a feeling between Richard and Julia Cowing that extended beyond friendship. Of this, Herbert Cowing was certain, but it never quite reached the point of engagement or understanding. Julia eventually married a New York doctor and settled into a quiet, childless domesticity. When a tragic train of circumstance threatened to dishonor Richard Wetherill's name a long time later, she was one of the first to spring to his defense. And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm.